I'd like to thank everybody for taking their time out uh, of their day to, to join us this morning for the training. We have uh, Stephen Ripka with Blemo. Uh, he's going to go over the Blemo damper actuator and control valve sizing and selection. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Stephen. All right, thanks, Jeff. So my name is Steve, and again, we're going to talk about just the basics of damper sizing and selection. Um, I'm not going to go into all the like nitty gritty details that a normal Bolimo, say, 101 training would go into. This is more geared to let you all know what pieces of information we need, what's important to you in the field, and how when you call into BCS or BCS has to call into Bolimo, that we don't have to call you back. You know, you get us the information we need and then we get you the part that you need and it's a seamless, pretty easy transition. Uh, some of the stuff I'll go over is just a little bit of the verbiage and the wiring, of course, which is important and a little bit of nomenclature. I'm not gonna beat you all over the head with the nomenclature, just to, so you understand what some of the key elements are so that you recognize that it's a spring return, a non-spring return, maybe an idea if it's a modulating or two position, just the basics of that. And then there's a process used to size and select a damper actuator. Um, I'm gonna simplify that and just go over a couple things that are key when you're in the field. If you can't ascertain what's on the existing actuator or you've got a new installation and you need to size something up, just the basics of getting that taken care of. A little bit about valve specs, what we include in our spec sheet, which may differ from what an engineer puts in their written specification. And I'll talk a little bit about the difference of what we offer in a spec or a data sheet versus the way an engineer spec is written. I'll talk a little bit about flow coefficient because that's a question anybody you call at Belimo at Building Controls and Solutions are going to ask if you know your GPM or the CV of the existing valve. I just want to let you know why that's important and how we can determine what the CV needs to be. Some of the basic formulas for control sizing, but again, nothing that's really something you have to memorize, just something that you know the importance of it and why the questions might be asked. And then just a little bit about the different valve offerings that we have in case you run into some unusual applications. So in today's world, you know, since um, really the late 70s, early 80s, the majority of new damper actuators are direct coupled. So they mount directly to the damper shaft. There are some unique damper actuators that are used in fire, smoke, or life safety applications. So if, if you've got a normal, you know, volume control damper on an air handler, you can use a standard actuator, just a normal off-the-shelf direct coupled actuator. But if you've got a life safety system, a fire smoke system that's maybe interlocked with an air handler or an exhaust fan, you need to make sure that the actuator you use or replace an existing actuator with is rated for fire, smoke, and life safety applications. One thing I like to point out is that if you've got an old existing damper actuator like you see here on the left, you don't necessarily have to replace that like for like. So as long as the actuator on the right meets the specs of the actuator on the left, you can replace it with a different model actuator. UL states that um, dampers are an appliance basically, and they have to be repaired in the field or they can be repaired in the field in coordination with the damper manufacturer specifications. Belimo provides fire smoke damper actuators to all the major damper manufacturers. So we have installation specs and guidelines. So anytime you're replacing an electronic or even a pneumatic damper actuator for that matter with a new electronic damper actuator, you can use a Belimo. Um, on our website, we have the specifications for the actuators and the instructions on how to do the retrofit. So when you ever come across a fire smoke damper that needs to be have the actuator replaced, think of Belimo. We've got all the solutions and also the instructions on how to do it. But it is important that you replace a fire smoke damper actuator with another fire smoke damper actuator. Sometimes you'll hear the question, is it normally open or normally closed? What's the start position of the actuator? And this happens almost more often when you're purchasing a valve. Is the valve normally open or normally closed? versus a damper actuator. But when we say normally closed, that means the position of the damper or the valve assembly with no signal. So if it's a two to 10 volt modulating signal, the position of the damper or the valve is gonna be at two volts is the normal position, start position, if you will. 
with Belimo, our most of our actuators have a switch on the face, and you can change the position of zero signal from clockwise to counterclockwise just by flipping that switch. Now, I'll tell you, I spent a lot of time in the field and a lot of time in distribution, and anytime we had a customer complain that something wasn't working right or something was working backwards, this switch was the culprit. If people don't have airflow or they don't have an exhaust fan engaged because it's interlocked with a damper actuator, they'll just flip this switch. If you go to a customer site and you see that this little switch notch is uh, worn out, <laughs> to say you know there's a problem and somebody's been flipping that switch incessantly, it really should be a set it and forget it type of deal. But if your actuation is backwards, before you even open up the J-Box and look at the wiring, take a look at this switch. And that'll let you know the start position and if there's end switches or such, where you need to be when there's a signal and when there's no signal. You're gonna hear the term fail-safe and non-fail-safe actuators with Belimo. Um, I think it is in 2019 or 2020, we changed the verbiage in the catalog. It used to say spring return and non-spring return. And now it says fail-safe and non-fail-safe. So there are two types of fail-safe actuators in our portfolio nowadays. We have spring return actuators that truly have a mechanical spring in them. When you drive against the spring, when you kill power, it springs either clockwise or counterclockwise 100%. So 90 degrees or zero degrees, depending on the way the actuator is mounted. If you look at these spring return actuators here on the center and the left, um, right, they can be mounted either way. So you can flip them over for clockwise or counterclockwise spring return. And then we also have electronic fail-safe actuators. So this is technology that we took time to develop. Um, some of you who've been in the field or the industry a long time may have a recollection of another manufacturer's electronic fail-safe actuators that kind of failed and didn't work very well. We use a certain type of technology that's called supercapacitor technology. There's a series of caps. So it's not just one cap that's discharging to uh, drive the actuator to its fail-safe position. It's a series and they charge and discharge in different sequences. So you don't run the risk of the capacitor burning out to discharge and drive that actuator to its fail-safe position. One of the nice things about electronic fail-safe is that in this actuator on the left, we have 360 inch pounds of torque. On this big dog over here on the right, we have 270 inch pounds of torque. This actuator on the left weighs far less and is far smaller of a footprint than the one on the right. And then the other thing is, as I mentioned, these two spring return actuators, they're designed to be mounted one way or the other for the specific clockwise and counterclockwise failsafe action. With the electronic failsafe, there's a little uh, dial on the front and it goes from zero to 90 degrees. So you can fail your actuator zero or fully clockwise, 90 degrees fully counterclockwise, or if for some reason upon failure, so upon loss of power, you need minimum airflow in an a damper, you need minimum water flow on a valve assembly, you can set this anywhere from zero to 90 degrees. So say you want to maintain 10, 20 degrees of opening to maintain a minimum flow for some reason or another through a valve, you can do that just by setting the dial on the electronic failsafe actuator. So it's a nice addition to the fail-safe technology. Non-fail-safe actuators, they simply stop in place when they lose power. So if it's a non-fail-safe, they tend to draw a little bit less VA, and when they lose power, they just stop. Both the fail-safe and non-fail-safe actuator on pawn loss of control signal will go to that start position I referenced. So it's just like they're receiving no command to open or close. Just quickly about some common uh, actuator control signals. You know, in the old days in Belimo, we used to talk about pulse width modulation and all this other stuff, really things that have gone by the wayside over the years. The three most common are gonna be on off or open close for two position, you know, isolation applications, floating point like you'll see on a VAV box. And then the most common these days are proportional control. So two to 10 volts DC is gonna be our dash SR offering. And now we have something called multifunction technology or the nomenclature will read dash MFT. And that's a configurable field input. So you can get it out of the factory at two to 10 volts DC, but if you need six to nine, 
zero to 10, whatever the case may be, you can go in with our ZPH US handheld tool or with our PC tool and change those input signal parameters to whatever they need to be in the field. I'm gonna just quickly point out a few things about our nomenclature. Again, I don't expect anyone on this call to memorize any of this stuff. It's just so you know what we're kind of looking for. In all cases, except for fire smoke, the first digit in our actuator nomenclature is gonna represent the torque. On a non fail safe, you'll see an M, which stands for motor. Generally, this third position is going to be blank. In this position here, the fourth position, you'll either have a B or an X. If it's an X, it's some customization from the factory. Generally, it's a B for most off-the-shelf op applications. 24 in this position is going to indicate voltage. This position here, where you see a dash three, will indicate whether it's on, off, or floating point. As I said, SR for two to 10 volts DC, multifunction technology. So this is your control signal. Whether it's got a whip, there'll be, if it's got a whip or a cable, there'll be nothing in this uh, designation here. If it's a terminal block connection, there'll be a dash T. And then on the far right, if there's auxiliary switches or if it's a NEMA 4 enclosure, you'll see information that indicates that application. And, and you'll know if it's NEMA 4, it'll look like a NEMA 4 enclosure. If it's got a heater in it, you'll see it when you open up the NEMA 4 enclosure as well. And in most warm weather climates, we do recommend using the heater to uh, prevent condensation in NEMA 4 and 4X enclosures. We also have a linear stroke actuator. So if you have an old pneumatic actuator that you really can't replace with a direct coupled, we've got a couple offerings and they're indicated by an H as opposed to an M. Spring return, mechanical spring return, very similar to what I just said, only there'll always be an F. So if you see an F in a Belimo part number, you'll know that that's a spring return actuator. Again, everything else is pretty much the same. One thing you'll start to see is UP. We do offer with some products universal power that will take anywhere from 24 to 240 volts AC or DC. Um, and that, that can change. You can have a 24 volt application take it, move it to another location where you've got 120 volts and the actuator will accept a different voltage. Again, all the signals, most common, dash three, SR and MFT, probably gonna be 99% of the signals you deal with. Switches, things like that, the NEMA 4, again, very similar to the previous screen. When we look at our electronic fail safe, the big difference here is the K. So if you see a K, that's gonna be an electronic fail safe Belimo damper actuator that has those supercapacitors and can be set for a specific degree of opening on failure. So that's the big difference there. One thing I will note is that with the electronic failsafe, as I mentioned earlier, we have higher torque options than single actuators. So we do have 360 inch pounds in a single direct coupled electronic failsafe actuator that draws about 20 VA. And believe it or not, we can do 1400 inch pounds um, in a single direct coupled actuator that also only draws 20 VA. It's got a smart heater in it. So the heater doesn't run when the motor's running. So that's how we get away with the lower VA rating. Um, these are generally found on our butterfly valves, but you can also get them for damper applications. In, we make a foot mount um, bracket that comes off the shelf from Belimo, or we can do a customized linkage depending on your application. So if you do need high, high torques and fail safe, take a look at the electronic fail safe offering. Finally, fire smoke. Same, same, except for there'll always be an FS to indicate that it's fire smoke. Everything's gonna line out the same. Um, the one big thing, more often than not, your fire smoke damper actuators are gonna be either 24, you'll see a lot of 120 volts. The next two positions are often blank. And then in a lot of cases, fire smoke dampers are interlocked with something else. So very common that you'll see a dash S. In the field, you may run across a damper mounted uh, mercury switch that is used to prove closure on the damper. You can use that in coordination with the FSAF or LF or NF, whatever actuator you choose. But it's important to know that a lot of times on fire smoke dampers, you do need some form of end switch for proof of closure and proof of open. So I'll go over some wiring real quick. With a mechanical fail-safe two-position actuator, it's simple. 
you have constant common and you switch the hot to drive it open, you remove the hot and it springs closed. Electronic failsafe is similar, only you tie the red and white wires together on a dash three model and you just switch power to those to drive it open or closed and then remove the power to spring in the, or fail in the other direction. That fail safe will be, that drive direction will be determined by this switch and it will just go to the opposite position once you remove power. Very simple, and you get a high torque application. If you've got a dash three on off actuator or floating point actuator that you want to wire for on off, you simply bring power to the red and black. So when power is applied to the red and black and the switch is in the one position, the actuator will be normally closed or normally clockwise. When you apply power to the white wire, it will drive counterclockwise. If you switch this switch to the other direction here, it will be normally counterclockwise and drive clockwise when you apply power. So again, this switch can kind of be like the root of some problems that people don't realize, but there's never a concern when you apply power to a Belimo actuator, that's a floating point actuator to the red and the white wire at the same time. That won't cause any damage whatsoever. Floating point, just like a VAV box, there's a null position. So we drive power red to drive clockwise, power white to drive counterclockwise. When the space is satisfied, the switch goes to the null position and power is not applied to either terminal or either wire. And the actuator just sits in place. The modulating actuators are gonna wire up very similar. They're gonna have black and red, basically power all the time. And then the signal input, whether it be two to 10 or if it's configured for something specific from the factory uh, to the Y or the white wire. And then we do have um, feedback wire, which is gonna be our orange or our, our five wire. The pink wire is used for specific MFT applications. 90% of the time you won't be dealing with it. So you'll have black, red for hot and common. Signal will be, go to the Y1 or the white input. And your feedback will come from the number five wire, which is generally gonna be orange. To figure out what we need, so we're gonna replace an actuator. There's a handful of stuff we need to know about the actuator itself, but most of it's gonna be inherent. You're gonna know because of the installation or you're gonna know because of the controller and stuff you're installing is gonna tell you what you need. So we're gonna to need to know the voltage and the signal. We're gonna to need to know the torque, which if it's an existing actuator, that's gonna say it's somewhere on the actuator. But if not, we can we'll address that in another slide or two. Uh, we need to know if it's a fail-safe or non-fail-safe application. Generally, that's going to be dictated in the field or on some drawings. Do you need feedback to the controller? Again, if there already is feedback on the controller, you generally want to uh, include that with your actuator selection. Does it need end switches for interlocks, typically in a fire smoke or life safety application? And then do you need other stuff, mounting brackets, linkages, stuff like that? You can see here on the right, um, these are not direct coupled actuators, they're foot mounted and they have a crank arm, a push rod, some ball joints and stuff. So Belimo makes all kinds of hardware that can help you foot mount direct coupled actuators in applications where you can't directly couple to the shaft. There's a bunch of steps. So back in the old days, well, we still have something called Belimo 101. And in Belimo 101, we painfully go through all 10 of these steps. Now I've been selecting, sizing, and installing damper actuators for about 20 years before I went to work for Belimo, and I never did any of this. So <laughs> a lot of information, and I think we can cut to the chase since everybody on this call's probably got a little bit of time in the field behind them. And I'll talk about a few helpful hints. So of course we need all that actuator information the torque, the voltage, all that good stuff, the signal. And then if we don't know the torque, the easiest way to calculate that is take the damper area in square foot and simply multiply it by seven, which is a torque loading factor for a damper actuator. That's a torque loading factor for a parallel blade damper with edge seals. Basically the highest torque loading factor we use other than for fire smoke dampers where we'll use the uh, torque loading factor of 10 and for round dampers where we also use a torque loading factor of 10. So if you just take your square foot face area of the damper, if it's two dampers, you need, you need the total square foot face area, multiply that by seven, 
what you'll generally find is the number you come up with doesn't specifically coincide with an actuator that we have available. And you'll tend to choose one that's a little bit bigger or has a little bit more torque. That is not gonna hurt the damper actuator, nor is it gonna hurt the damper itself. So again, face area by ten, seven for square or rectangular. Fire smoke, face area by 10. And then with round dampers, uh, face area by 10 to determine your torque requirement for round dampers. But as you can see here, up to 22 inch pounds, we only really need about 20, or up, up to 22 inches. We only need about 25 inch pounds. So in most round damper applications, a Belimo LF 24SR or LMB 24SR is gonna suffice and even have more torque than needed. Just a quick look at the face area calculation is pi r squared. So I can do pi times the radius squared to determine your face area, the round damper. But again, if you use these simple rules of thumb or use one of our smaller actuators for 22 inches and below, you should have no problem. As I mentioned, um, some actuators are foot mounted. You have mod motors and things like that. Foot mounted actuator with foot mounting bracket, or even a direct coupled actuator with foot mounting brackets, linkages, crank arms, things like that to replace actuators that were foot mounted actuators. The important thing to note is when you foot mount a direct coupled actuator, you use a lose a little bit of torque. So anytime you're doing a foot mount application with a direct coupled actuator and a mounting bracket and crank arms and push rods and all that good stuff, deduct or, or assume you need about 12 to 15% more torque than the calculation just to compensate for the slop in the crank arms and the linkages and the ball joints. But generally it can be done. So if you've got something like this or an old mod motor that you've got a proper signal to control a direct coupled actuator with, there is a way to foot mount a simple direct coupled actuator with some hardware to replace a foot mount. So that's it on actuators. Uh, I know that's a lot, but we want to try to keep it simple and straightforward. You know, again, we don't expect anybody to under learn every digit and every part of a Belimo actuator part number. We want you to know the key elements, the key things that a Someone like Building Controls and Solutions is going to ask you when you're on the phone or need to get you the right product. So we're trying to just give you an overview on what you need to get, parts you need in the field and get the job done. So I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about valve sizing and selection. And this is primarily going to pertain to what we call pressure dependent valves. So control valves, like characterized control valves, lobe valves, butterfly valves, things like that. When you look at our specs, so we will have a spec sheet or a data sheet on our website available for pretty much every valve assembly we make. And it's gonna include things like the body pressure rating, close off pressure, uh, maximum delta P, which is differential pressure, the temperature ratings. Um, and then these will be items that you find in an engineer specs and requirements. Then we'll have some things like the characterization curve, characterization curve valve authority turndown and rangeability, which Turn down and rangeability are not really commonly used. You may run across an old school engineer that specs rangeability or a specific turn down. That can be addressed if the product we offer doesn't have a specified rangeability or turn down. So rangeability is basically the minimum to maximum flow range a valve can achieve in a factory condition. So you can put any actuator on it, you can control it however you see fit, and you just that minimum to maximum controllable flow. Turn down is the same thing, but in an installed condition where there's variations in system dynamics, feet ahead, differential pressure, stuff like that. Again, this is sort of an old school terminology, really was common in the pneumatic days. If you have an engineer that, again, is insisting on a specific uh, turn down ratio or rangeability, let the folks who are building control solutions know or let us know and we'll help you address it. And then the actuation side is simply going to be what we talked about on the air side for damper actuators, just applying to the water side or on valve assemblies. Body pressure rating is basically the maximum body pressure that that valve body can handle without failing. 
when I say failing, I don't mean that the stem's gonna blow up and the valve's gonna explode. We have what we call an AB seam here on the right side of the valve. And that's where the parts and pieces, the, the packing, the stems, all the trim goes into the valve body. And then this is tightened up and there's a sealant put on it and it's brought to a certain temperature to seal that seam. If we exceed the body pressure rating, this is where you'll start to see a slight drip. And um, that's how you know you've exceeded your body pressure rating. It's not as if it's a catastrophic failure, but of course on a new construction or any installation, you don't want water leaking out of your valve. When it comes to flange valves and ANSI pressure ratings, it's important to note that pressure and temperature are inversely proportional. So as our working pressure or temperature goes up, our working pressure comes down. With anti-class flanged valve bodies, or even threaded depending on if it's an older globe valve, you'll see that at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit, an anti-class 125 flanged valve body can handle about 200 PSI, while at 150 degrees Fahrenheit, a ANSI class 250 valve that's 12 inches or smaller can handle about 500 PSI. This 150 degree temperature at times in an engineer spec, again, if it's an old school spec, may be referred to as cold working pressure, which is essentially for condensing and chilled water applications. So it's important to note, if you are in a higher pressure situation, you'll get 200 PSI out of an ANSI class 125 valve at cold working pressure or at 150 degrees Fahrenheit and lower, and you'll get 500 PSI out of an ANSI 250 valve that's 12 inches or smaller at 150 degrees or lower. So again, just because it says ANSI 125 doesn't mean that 125 PSI is the maximum pressure rating. We have to take into consideration the working temperatures of the system. Close off pressure is simple. It's how much pressure the valve can withstand without letting that water flow by in the closed position. More often than not, our characterized control valves or CCV pr product has a cl uh, closed off pressure rating of about 200 PSI. Generally, that's more than sufficient for all systems. ANSI leakage ratings, not something that we need to have a great understanding of, but it's important to know that if a valve has an ANSI, cl ANSI class leakage rating and it's not bubble tight, the bubble tight implies that there's no water leakage up to a certain pressure input, while ANSI ratings actually have a certain amount of leakage. So globe valves have an ANSI class three, maybe an ANSI class four leakage rating, Newer globe valves have an ANSI class six leakage rating. So a little bit of water always passes through a valve with an ANSI leakage rating, specifically a globe valve. So the reason I bring this up is simple. Not that we need to understand every element of every ANSI class leakage rating, but for isolation purposes, globe valves are not a good choice because they do leak a little bit of water by even when they're closed. And that's just based on the plug and seat design of the globe valve. If that plug completely sealed up against the seat, it would take an inordinate amount of torque to get it off. So again, for isolation purposes, you don't want to choose a globe valve. The maximum differential pressure is basically how much DP, the difference between the entering pressure and the leaving pressure, that the valve can stand without damaging the internal parts. More often than not, maximum DP ratings are around 50, which should be more than sufficient for the majority of systems out there, especially in the HVAC world. If you get into the industrial process world, that may change a little bit, and we do have some solutions, but for your normal HVAC applications, the standard CCVs and pressure independent valves all have sufficient differential pressure ratings. Characterization curves, I'm just gonna go over this quickly so you know what they are, and uh, why we use them. Basically, what we're looking at here is the equal percentage flow curve. The majority of control valves on air handlers, fan coils, uh, any unitary equipment is going to require an equal percentage flow curve. And it's designed to mirror the power or the heating and cooling output of the coil associated with the equipment. Linear is basically if you have a 50% command to that valve, you're going to have a 50% output. 
most commonly used in bypass applications or for steam applications. And I'm really not gonna go to a whole lot on steam here today, um, but Jeff, if that's something you all think you're interested in, we can do an entire um, webinar on steam valves and sizing and applications. There's quick opening or two position valves. These are your zone valves. You know, what you might know is an old Erie pop top or a Kalefi valve. You send it 24 volts or 100 volts, it opens, it provides a lot of flow quickly and you heat or cool. And then when the, the demand's met, you release the valve, it closes and it stops heating and cooling. Very basic valve. Belimo's made some nice changes to the globe of uh, the zone valve world. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. Modified equal percentage. This is what you get with butterfly valves. And when we talk about butterfly valves, you'll often hear people saying, are you using it for control or for isolation? If you're using it for isolation, this curve becomes relatively uh, unimportant. You're just gonna open and close, maybe to isolate a chiller or a boiler. While if you're using it for control, say you've got a really large uh, heat exchanger or air handler and you need a big butterfly valve, it's the only thing that will fit the application. Um, the equal percentage curve ends at about 60 degrees and then it becomes very linear. So we suggest that you size for uh, control applications when you're using a butterfly valve for a maximum flow rate at 60 degrees of opening. And we actually publish both 60 degree and 90 degree or full open CVs for all of our butterfly valves. So when we size basic control valve, common question is going to be, well, what's the GPM or what's the CV or the flow coefficient? And basically, the CV or the flow coefficient is the amount of water that fl flows through a fully open valve with one pound of drop. So at one pound of differential, if you have four pounds in and three pounds out, that's one pound of differential, uh, your CV is going to equal GPM. But generally, we have more differential than that. And so we use this little formula, CV equals GPM divided by the square root of the delta P to determine your CV requirement. Now, not as complicated as it may sound because generally for our delta P, we size based on a three to five pound drop uh, for modulating applications. So more often than not, we'll use four. So you can simply cut your GPM in half, to determine your CV. But here we'll take a quick look at the formula if I've got a GPM of eight and I'm sizing using a four pound drop, I need a CV of four. All well and good, easy math. But what I wanna point out is when you look at the Belimo catalog, you might not have a valve rated for four CV. So you've got two options here. You've got three and you've got 4.7. Of course, conventional wisdom is gonna say, well, I don't wanna starve that piece of equipment. Uh, four is certainly closer to 4.7 than it is to three. And if I undersize, I'll need more differential and I'll need more feet ahead, I'll need more pumping energy. So my system will be less efficient than it would be if I have the bigger valve. Now, oversizing too much can be a problem as well because it can, can cause some slop in the control and won't be as accurate. But of course, it won't cause any starvation. It won't cause the um, pumps to have to work harder and the system to have to be on longer. Now, to determine how much differential pressure we need to get a valve. A valve needs to get the specific GPM at its design CV. We use this formula and this is actually more helpful to me than the CV formula itself. So what we do is we take the valve CV divided by, by the divided into the required GPM and then square it. So if we look at our previous example, we took that valve with a CV of three in an 8 GPM application, we need 7.1 PSI to get eight gallons per minute through this B212, which is a lot of differential pressure. It's higher than most ASHRAE standards or designs. So if we use the 4.7 CV B213 for an eight gallon per minute application, we need right around three gallons per minute. And that works out good because when it comes to ASHRAE recommendations, we generally use between three and five pounds of drop to size for modulating applications and about one PSI for on-off applications. That can be a little higher depending on the location, depending on the engineer, depending on the application. But in on-off applications, you're simply opening the valve to 90 degrees open, satisfying the space and closing it. So as long as you have enough um, CV to meet 
one PSI at the GPM. So if your CV equals your GPM in an on-off application, you're fine. One thing you don't want to do here is have a control valve that is larger than the runout pipe or the coil connection. So that is something to keep in mind when you're sizing on-off valves for on-off applications. And there's also something called pipe reduction factor. Uh, there was a time when we actually published a chart in the old Bulimo PGPL. And I'll tell you, one lesson I learned when I was uh, in the distribution world is never throw away your catalogs because those old catalogs have information in them that uh, may not get reprinted, may get lost in the shuffle. So it, it's always good to keep those old reference materials. But if you have a valve with a high CV and you have a bigger pipe and you have to reduce down, say, from a one inch to a half inch pipe in this particular application with a valve um, that has a CV of 16, you actually reduce the CV capabilities of that valve considerably. So what we like to suggest is the control valve should be no smaller than two pipe sizes down or half the pipe size. It's also important to note that Bolimo makes um, valves with really high CVs. So you may see a half inch valve with a nine or a 10 or a 16, 17 CV. Generally, that's not always a good valve to utilize you have to look at the application. Um, my rule of thumb is with half inch valves at about that 4.7 CV, you're at about nine and a half gallons per minute of four pounds of drop. That's enough. That's about as much as a half inch valve should handle. Um, it'll start to create turbulence if you get too much above that. and also might create some acoustic instabilities and start making some noise. So there is a little bit of, um, fuzzy logic, if you will, when you're looking at sizing a valve, you don't want to just size for the CV at a pressure drop. Um, you'll find that every now and then somebody just uses the smallest valves they can for the design CVs. They don't take a look at the coil connections and the runouts. They just size to get the right CV. And then you wind up with a system that needs a whole lot more pump head and starts making noise. So it's a little bit of, from column A, a little bit from column B. But again, that's why you have folks at Building Controls and Solutions and at Belimo to kind of help make sure the decisions are made uh, accurately and in the best interest of the overall system. I mentioned these characterized control valves. These are the most common valves you probably see in the industry today. And uh, you know, Belimo is certainly not the only one who makes them. We did introduce these back in 1999. And what this is, it's a reduced port ball valve with a characterizing disc. And the characterizing disc opens very slowly to create those equal percentage flow characteristics we talked about. Um, you may come across a Belimo CCV with no characterizing disc in it. It does, to a certain extent, have some equal flow, equal percentage flow characteristics because, because it's a reduced port valve. And when I say reduced port valve, that means the bore where the water actually flows through is a size smaller than the NPT or the pipe thread size of the valve body itself. Globe valves, been around forever, uh, still something Belimo offers. Typical linear stroke with a plug-in seat design. You lift the plug off the seat, you allow water to flow through, you push the plug back down on the seat, stops the water flow, less the little bit of linkage that passes from the A port to the AB. Threaded globe valves from Belimo. If you buy a three-way threaded globe valve from Belimo, it can be piped just like a three-way characterized control valve in a mixing or diverting application. So in a mixing application, the water would come from the coil into the A port, out the AB port, or from the supply to the B port and back out the A port, port to the return of the system. So when the coil's closed off, the B port or the bypass is open and we're just flowing water back to the system. It can be also piped in a diverting path or, or fashion where you pipe water into the AB port. So when we talk about the AB port, we'll use the term common. It's the common port to both other ports. And if you're using a diverting application, it'll pipe into the AB, out the B, or out the A to the coil, or out the B to the return as a bypass. Again, half inch to two inch, it's one valve body 
for mixing or diverting, they just pipe different. And they pipe exactly like the Bolimo characterized control valve. When it comes to flanged valves, this is where things get a little different. So standard 2A flange globe valve, no problem. Pipe into the A port from the coil, out to the AB port, it's gonna work just like any other two-way valve. However, when it comes to mixing and diverting flanged valves, there are two different valve bodies. And you cannot make a diverting valve into a mixing valve or a mixing valve into a diverting valve in the field. You're stuck with what you get. So a mixing valve is gonna have an input from the A port or an input from the B port, and it's gonna flow to the common of the AB port, which is gonna be on the side of the valve. The diverting valve pipes very differently. That common port, that AB port I referred to, is on the bottom. The water will flow into the AB port on the bottom of the valve, and then either out the left A port or the right B port. So as you can see, the piping configurations are very different. And it's important that when you're talking to a customer, an owner, um, a facility operator, it's important they understand the difference between a mixing and a diverting valve. Um, and you may, to, may actually need to go take a look at, your set, at it yourself to make sure they've got the right concept and the right valve body that they need. Because again, if you buy a diverting valve, which there's a couple key things you'll note when you are buying a Bolimo, or for the most part, anybody's diverting valve, the part number is generally different. So with a Bolimo three-way mixing flange globe valve, you'll have a G7 part number. If it's a diverting, there'll be a D in that part number. Another glaring factor is that that diverting valve is going to be more expensive than the mixing valve. So again, it's just important we keep in mind the different port configurations of mixing and diverting and know that they are different applications. Again, with the mixing valves, it's two inputs. A and B, one output, the AB common. With a diverting valve, it's one input, the AB is the common, and then the two sides of the valve, the A and the B ports are the outputs. And generally, these are just two position diverting valves while the mixing valves are more often modulated. Most common butterfly valve in the industry and that we sell is the resiliency butterfly valve. Uh, they're rotary valves. They have modified equal percentage flow characteristics. So again, if you are selecting these for a control application, you want to select your CV at 60 degrees, not 90 degrees. If it's a isolation application, you simply line size them and bolt them in place. No gaskets or anything like that. It's resilient seat, so it's got this um, EPDM liner that compresses to seal the valve. And um, one thing to know, if you use them for dead end service, they need a blind or a makeup flange on the leaving end so the seat compresses and does not leak. And they can handle about up to 12 feet per second in velocity. Three-way butterfly valves are simply three-way, two, two-way valves on a T to make them three-way valves. Nothing fancy about those, all the same parameters, different con configurations, mixing or diverting. It's pretty simple to select these for resilient seat butterfly valves because the flow is bi-directional. When you get to high performance butterfly valves, the flow is going to be direction specific. I'm not really gonna get into too much about um, high performance butterfly valves, but again, that's another topic for another time if needed. Generally, they have one or two actuators. Of course, it's a lot easier. You can get the assembly with one actuator. And that goes back to that big 1400 inch pound actuator I talked about a little earlier. They have that modified equal percentage flow characteristic that at about 60 degrees, we start to go linear. So as you can see, we publish a CV for 90 degrees for control purposes, and then the full open CV for 90 degrees. Those high performance butterfly valves I mentioned are gonna be ANSI 150 and ANSI 300 class carbon steel valves. These are far more expensive. They have higher temperature and pressure ratings higher velocity ratings. Uh, generally, it's gonna be something that you use in a high story, a high rise building and a high pressure system. They're also rated for bi-directional dead end service without a makeup flange. So there's a lot more to the high performance or um, dual capacity butterfly valve, but it's something that you'll know if you're in the field that you're dealing with a high performance butterfly valve. It will physically look a lot different than a resilient seated valve. And the part numbers will also be very different as well. 
talked about velocity just to influence, uh, emphasize 12 feet per second for standard butterfly valves. The high performance butterfly valves are rated for 32 feet per second. So again, higher velocity, higher temperatures, more stringent applications for high performance valves. We do offer something called the segmented ball valve or a V-ball valve. Again, a high pressure application, not something you're gonna come across too often. It does have this high range ability that you know, the engineers used to look for, their equal percentage flow characteristics. More often than not, I find these used in higher pressure steam applications, very rarely in hydronic or heating and cooling water applications. The zone valve, that quick opening valve, it's an inexpensive valve. You're gonna often find these on OEM equipment. So someone bought a bunch of fan coils or a bunch of, of VAV boxes with hydronic reheat. Zone valves are commonly used in that application. They're installed at the factory and just uh, the return side and the supply side are fit up in the field. They come with fail safe and non fail safe actuators. One of the nice things Bolimo did here was we developed this little two watt actuator. So this is a quick connect actuator. There's no hardware that holds it onto the valve body. It simply pulls off the valve mounting bracket or mounting plate. It's a low torque, act, a high torque actuator with low power draw and a very small footprint. So if you're replacing an old zone valve, an old pop topper, you know, other manufacturer zone valve and you're concerned about space, the Balimo zone valve will always fit in place and it's bi-directional flow. So you can pipe it in either orientation on a two-way valve and it's going to work just fine. We actually use a seat and a ball for these valves. So we have higher close off ratings. We have much better control when the valve actually closes. There's no water leaking by like there are with most zone valves. And if you've got three, four hundred reheat coils or fan coils or whatever the case may be, um, that leakage starts to add up. So these Bolimo zone valves, again, they work a lot like an old characterized control valve or reduced port ball, ball valve and they have that bubble tight leakage rating. So they don't leak by when the valve is closed. Oh, it's also important to know that with the three-way valve, they only pipe in switching or diverting manners and they only come with uh, on off two position actuators. As I mentioned, more often than not in that diverting application, it's usually a two position control anyway and not a modulation. Finally, the last type of valves I'm gonna talk about before we finish up are pressure independent control valves. These are valves that give you a specific GPM for every incremental increase of control signal or decrease in control signal from the controller. So it compensates for system dynamics. As the pumps ramp up and down, the differential pressure across the valve changes depending on the valve's location in the system. And the pressure independent valve is just what it sounds like. It's independent of the pressure in the system. So it compensates. It does a little fine tuning at the valve level to make sure you're getting the exact GPM you need based on the input from the controller. One nice thing about this is it serves as a control valve and PI valves serve as a balancing valve. So if you're doing a retrofit, you can either fully open that balancing valve, take it out of the system and just put an isolation valve in. Or if you're looking at an engineer's design and you see PI valves, and the engineer also includes balancing valves, you can redline that and tell them, hey, we just need an isolation valve here. We don't need a secondary balancing valve because the pressure independent valve or pressure independent valve does the balancing as well as the control. In the world of Bolimo, there's gonna be three typical pressure independent valves. At a half inch and three quarter inch, we have a little mechanically regulated pressure independent valve designed for those unitary applications with that low wattage actuator, low footprint actuator I talked about. And these can either be two position or modulating. In a two position application, they open, they provide the right flow and that's it. So they can be set and forgotten. They don't need to be balanced after they're set, maybe just spot checked. And then in modulating the applications, they work like a standard modulating pressure independent control valve. From there, we moved on and some years ago developed what we call the electronic pressure independent valve. So we used to offer these mechanically regulated valves in big sizes, up to two inches uh, and 100 gallons per minute. 
they were very big valves, they were very heavy valves, and they got expensive because of all the raw materials that they required to build. What we found over years is we were able to drive down the cost of flow meters. So when we look at this electronic pressure independent valve here, that's a flow meter on the entering side. And the flow meter measures the GPM going through the valve, compares it to the control signal going to the actuator, and make sure that the valve is flowing the right GPM based on the input from the controller at any given time. So you've got a meter and you've got a control valve working together to give you the specific GPM. We took that and, and kind of built on it and added some temp sensors to an electronic pressure independent valve to develop something called the Belimo energy valve. So this is an electronic pressure independent valve that can measure and calculate BTUs. And then inside under the hood of this valve, we have something called Delta T management. So the Belimo energy valve can actually make sure that the Delta T across the coil or any heat exchanger is at or above design at all times. So it's a real energy efficiency driven product. And I always like to say, anytime you're replacing a valve that's in the field existing, a globe valve, a CCV, whatever the case may be, with a Belimo energy valve, you are doing not only a valve replacement, but an energy upgrade or an energy project. Again, there's a lot to the Belimo energy valve, so probably another story for another day. With that said, I know this was a lot of information and I know I talk fast. I appreciate everyone's time. And if there are any questions, uh, feel free to chime in, unmute yourself and, Ask me whatever you like.